Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. And this is Words and Numbers. This is Words and Numbers, brought to you by James and Anthony. If you would like to sponsor Words and Numbers, this is the one time I will say, give us an email. Only for this, not for any of the crazy things that I've been getting lately. You should all be a little bit ashamed of yourselves. (laughs) What's new and exciting in your world this weekend? I want to talk about sustainability. Oh, I I said interesting. Yeah, I know. I have the same opinion. This is one of these things. The term popped up in business maybe, I want to say, 10, 15 years ago. And universities across the country started sustainability MBA programs. Now, it's not entirely clear to me what that means. In fact, it's not entirely clear to the people who design the things what that means. And the reason I know this is because... I got hold of one of the leading books on teaching sustainability. And you go through this thing, and the definitions it gives for the word, first off, it gives several definitions for the word, but they're internally inconsistent. They're contradictory, not only with each other, but a definition itself will contradict itself. So I don't think anybody knows what this thing means. I can see the practical effects. It comes out as being environmentalism dressed up as business. But nonetheless, I was having a conversation with some of my MBA students today, and of course, as it will, the topic of sustainability comes up. And in their minds, I think this is, again, some form of environmentalism. And one of the students asked, we were talking about cooperation and coercion, and one of the students asked, isn't this an appropriate role for coercion, climate change? We say this in our book, an appropriate role for government is in preventing people from imposing harm on others. You know, I don't know enough to say one way or the other, but I could say conditionally, look, if it is the case that human action is raising global temperatures and in turn that's imposing a cost on people, then this is an appropriate role for government to clamp down on these greenhouse emissions. We've been doing this for years. There are all kinds of anti-pollution laws and nobody looks at those and say, well, these are fundamentally unjust. Yeah, that's true. But I I would imagine that people are asking the question now, why didn't we go further? Why don't we have more? And that's kind of where this discussion was going until it dawned on me. Hang on a second. The reason we're having this conversation at all about the appropriate role of government stepping in and preventing greenhouse gas emissions is because the government stepped in already, but it stepped in in the wrong place. Back in the 1960s, 1970s, when the government decided we weren't going to have any more nuclear reactors. Had it not done that, we could be today like France, getting 70% of our energy from nuclear. There would have been no greenhouse gas emissions there. So oddly, we're back in this place that we frequently end up of people calling for government action to fix a problem that was created by previous government action. And I've never really understood why it is that the environmentalists that we have, and there's a lot of them, why they're so against nuclear power. You can say things like, okay, we can eliminate coal from the process. Right. And I get it. That's going to cause other people a lot of trouble. But if your goal is getting power that doesn't pollute, nuclear is your best option. And yet nobody, as far as I can tell uh, from the environmentalist side, seems at all willing to jump into that hole. And honestly, I don't know why. No, what they're jumping on is the renewable stuff, the solar and the wind. And and that's fine for solving local problems, but there's no way that that can serve as a large scale. I'm sorry, the wind doesn't blow fast enough and the sun isn't intense enough to generate enough power from those sources. I could generate enough power for my house in Tucson, Arizona using solar power, but it's so expensive that it would take me a decade or more to pay off the array that I would have to put on top of the house. So that's just not efficient enough, is it? If the price were lower, I would likely do it. Although I was thinking of you the other day, you've heard of the Vanta Black, this ultimate black color that they've invented that you could shine a spotlight on it and nothing reflects back at you, right? They've invented now ultimate white. They're talking about the uses of this thing. And one of the interesting uses is that this paint is so white, it emits more infrared radiation than hits it. If we were to paint the roof of your house with this ultra white paint, the paint itself would act as an air conditioner and cool your house. 
I'd be more than happy to do that. I'd drag my ass up to the roof and do it myself if that <laughs> right. were true. But that wasn't my first thought. My first thought was I have to make black clothing out of this. The vent of black. <laughs> right. You disappear. That's, I, that's right. That's what I really need. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess we'll all see. But as is often the case, Ant, I'm not going to be talking about environmentalism this week or probably any other. Instead, I want to talk about a musician, maybe one that even you have heard of uh, by the name of Eric Clapton. You've, you've heard oh, this name God. before. Oh, my God. Yeah, Clapton. He's great. Yeah, if I asked you to name three songs that he played on, you'd fail miserably. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, Clapton, believe it or not, was a pretty diehard anti-vaxxer. Was he really? He was. He said he would never play a vaccine-mandated show, ever. And yet he is now playing a vaccine-mandated show in New Orleans. And, and you start to realize that we're back here at this point, finally, at the position of trade-offs. Right. What do you want? What are you willing to give for it? Clapton, obviously, wanted to play and wanted to make a living by playing more than he wanted to remain an anti-vaxxer. So he took the vaccine. Not shockingly, he's not dead. People are calling him a hypocrite. I'll, I'll link the Rolling Stone article for you in the show notes. I don't think that's right. I think he had an opinion. It was probably pretty strong. He took in other ideas after he expressed the opinion, and he changed his mind. And isn't that what we would want people to do? I want people to consider evidence, and if the evidence requires it, change their minds. And, you know, Rolling Stone is all up on his back, but I'm fine with it. He's a fantastic guitar player. I've seen him before. He puts on a hell of a show. And I'd like to see him again. He's getting to the age where he's probably never going to tour again. I'm glad that he reassessed and he came to a, a different conclusion. This isn't hypocrisy like you get with politicians. Hypocrisy is when you say one thing knowing full well you're never going to do it. Right. Changing your mind is simply learning and growing. That's right. And I try to do that every day with the things that you know we like to think about. My thoughts are never all that concrete because there's more evidence out there for damn near everything. So instead of picking on him, I say, hey, Eric Clapton, way to go. You can email me anytime you want to. We'll work something out. <laughs> We'd be happy for you to sponsor Words and Numbers. Well, that'd be great, but not necessary. I'd just like to have a talk. Maybe you come on as a guest. Which, of course, that brings us to the foolishness of the week. I look back to January of this year, and I think about what we've got now, and the foolishness level has escalated. Let me read a headline for you. Horse owners are struggling to buy ivermectin as Americans scramble for the unproven COVID-19 treatment, and Amazon sellers cash in by gouging prices. Oh, predictable. Say. Right. Yeah. No, so there's a lot going on in that headline. The first thing is the funny one, right? At least it's funny to me because I don't own horses. The American people, by and large, and many people around the globe have decided they want to take ivermectin. And that's fine. It's a drug that's suitable for human use. But look what happens when they do. Now, a horse medicine is not available anymore for the horses. Yeah. But that last part is really interesting too, right? Amazon sellers are price gouging, which means that the price is rising due to increased demand. Are they offering this product for too much? Not if they're selling it. If they put a million dollar price tag on it, nobody would buy it. Now they're charging too much. If they put an $800 price tag on it and lots of people buy it, it's definitionally not too expensive. Yeah, somebody's willing to pay that. That's right. And of course they are. I don't know a better sign of the times than this one headline. We did an episode some time ago on price gouging, and I just love that topic. I'd love to come back to it at some point. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, you know, every time there's a hurricane right, yeah. and there are state governors, of course, we're going to have material. But think this through a minute, what the effect is going to be. If you've got people charging a huge price for ivermectin, it's sending a signal to entrepreneurs everywhere. Get hold of ivermectin and put it on the market. Start making more. Yeah, you've deputized the entire planet as people search for ivermectin and try and get it to the people who are willing to pay for it. And frankly, I don't know a whole lot about it. I don't think I need to know a whole lot about it. I don't think people who want it are crazy. I don't think people who don't want it are crazy. Live the life you want to live. I, I don't care. But ultimately, you're looking at something that could be produced at higher rates and could make everybody happy. Yeah. 
because on the one side, the producers are going to make a fair amount of money if they just make more. On the other side, consumers will pay less if they just make more. And that's a prescription for everybody to be made happy. When everybody can be made happy, you should probably do it. To get more Anton James, buy a copy of our excellent book, Cooperation and Coercion. You can find the paper and electronic versions on Amazon and the audio version on Audible. All right, Ant. This week, we're going to talk about something I really don't like talking about and something that you bring up probably on average more than any other topic. Right. Well, I got roped into doing research some years ago on the estate tax. The way things work in economics, you end up doing some research on something and you become an expert on the thing. And then somebody comes along who wants to know something about this and you have to do some more research. And before you know it, you're one of the top people who others go to for this topic. And that's kind of how I ended up here. I was never interested in this estate tax, but here kind I of am. like the rest of us. None of us are interested in the estate tax. Well, yeah, and understandably so. On the one hand, polls that come out show that Americans viscerally dislike the idea. It's called colloquially a death tax, which really probably is a better descriptor. But Americans tend not to like the idea because you've earned money over your life and you pay taxes on that and you earn interest on your savings, you pay taxes on that. And then when you're dead, that should just be it. And yet along comes the government wanting to take more. But on the upside, the estate tax hits very few people, like on the order of one tenth of one percent of tax filers have to pay estate tax. And the exemption is like $12 million. So it only hits over $12 million. So virtually everybody can say, look, this is a non-issue. And by the way, the total amount of tax revenue the federal government collects on the estate tax is less than 1% of the federal budget. So in so many ways, it's a non-issue. However, I got a call about a week ago asking me to do some research on changes in estate tax rules that Joe Biden has proposed. And the changes fall under this heading. He calls it the American Families Plan. And there's a bunch of pieces to it. But what was interesting to me as I dug into it is it talks about upping the estate tax rate, and that's one issue. But what was more interesting to me were three other issues that kind of ran under the radar here. These are also part of the American Families Plan. The first is capital gains taxes. So this is the tax you pay when you buy something and sell it later at a higher price. Typically think about it relating to stocks, but also relates to houses, for example. But if I buy, for example, a house for $50,000 and years later sell it for $150,000, I've made a $100,000 gain. And so I would pay some tax on that. It's called the capital gains tax. Well, here's the thing. Up until the present, including the present, when you die and leave your assets to your heirs, to your children, they get to benefit from what's called a stepped up basis. And it works like this. Let's say you, James, buy a house for $50,000 and years later, it's worth $150,000. You don't sell it, but you leave it to your kids. And the kids inherit it. At the time they inherit it, it's worth $150,000. And later on, let's say they sell it for $200,000. According to the rules that have existed for decades, your kids would only pay tax on that $50,000 difference, the difference between what it was worth when they inherited it and what they sold it for. Now, one of the changes that Joe Biden has in mind is to get rid of that benefit. By getting rid of that benefit, what that means is if you bought your house for $50,000 and years later you die and you leave it to your kids and your kids eventually sell it for two hundred, dollars they've got to pay tax on $150,000. The difference between what they sold it for and what you bought it for. So right off, you can see there's some extra taxes that are going to show up here for heirs. And you say, well, yeah, but that kind of tax only applies to the very rich, to which I say, no, it doesn't. Under Joe Biden's plan, this is not an estate tax, a death tax. It's a capital gains tax. That applies to you, to me, to everybody else. Now, he has put in a $1 million exemption. Watch that go straight down. How many years will that take to go down to 100000 And that's an interesting thing because it's a much heavier lift 
taking away that stepped up basis rule that's making all this possible than it is to knock down that million dollar exemption. So once he gets his foot in the door, it's going to be easy to knock down the million dollar exemption. But nonetheless, you might look at that and say, okay, but million dollar exemption, who has millions of dollars? That's the rich. I give you a scenario. We're going to do all this adjusted for inflation. Let's suppose you begin work at age 20 and your household earns $50,000, which is right on the border between lower income and middle income. So you're not even solidly middle class here. And let's suppose that you stay at that $50,000 level for your entire career. So you're a solidly lower middle class to middle class household, but you're frugal. You save 15% of your paycheck every time it comes in and you invest it in a portfolio of stocks, standard portfolio. By the time you retire, you've got $1.5 million. Now you die and leave it to your kids. Under Joe Biden's plan, your kids are gonna owe, now they get a million dollar exemption, but they're gonna owe 20% tax on that extra half million. So your kids are gonna have to write a check to Uncle Sam for $260,000, $270,000. And all over the place right now, people are saying, well, I mean, you get to keep almost all that cash. And so you do. But what if it's not cash? And that is an interesting story. Let's suppose it's not cash. Let's suppose it's a business. Let's say it's a family farm. Everybody's angry about family farms disappearing. Let's think of it as a family farm. Sure, family farm, family business, whatever it is, it's got a bunch of assets that are worth millions of dollars, but it doesn't generate millions of dollars of income. It generates standard income. According to Joe Biden's plan, your heirs are going to owe capital gains on that. And they're going to owe it immediately. In other words, it's not that they inherit the business and later on when they sell the business, they owe the capital gains. They owe the capital gains the instant they inherit the business. And look, anybody, literally anybody, tax expert, not tax expert, should be able to figure out exactly what happens next. Yeah. And what happens next is your kids have a strong incentive to sell off pieces of this business. That's the only way they're going to raise the money to be able to pay the tax man. In many cases, it's not pieces, it's the whole business to begin with. Right. When you're thinking about family farms, think about all of the cross-cutting currents here. You're left with a farm that you literally can't afford to keep. Who knows that you have an asset that you can't afford to keep? Answer, everyone. Now, when that's true, what kind of deal are you gonna get on the asset? Are you gonna get its full list value? You absolutely aren't. You're going to get taken. Somebody's going to buy that at like a 25, 30% discount because they know you can't wait. They know you have to sell it right now. And whenever you have to sell something right this minute, you take a massive hit on its valuation. Now, Joe Biden says that he's built into his plan an exemption for farms and family businesses. Here we go. Here but we go. But the exemption doesn't exempt you from the tax. All it says is that you don't have to pay the tax until you sell the business. So you're going to pay this new tax we're talking about regardless. The question is, do you pay it now or later? But here's why I drag you through the mud on all of this nonsense. And trust me, I know it's a bit eye glazing. But here's the thing. You and I have said in the past that the federal government's going to run out of rich people to tax. And when it runs out of rich people to tax, it's going to turn its attention to the middle class and then to the poor. This is the first shot across the bow. We have a death tax that applies to the super rich. This animal, they call it a capital gains tax, but if you put together the pieces, it looks and acts and quacks exactly like a death tax. This is the death tax for the middle class. Let that sink in for a minute or two, because, yeah, it's about these sorts of things now. But what's it going to be about later? And if you know the story of the federal income tax, which Anthony's going to tell you in about two seconds, you know full well that whatever is being floated today, that's just designed to be a new baseline. Right. And we're going to build from that new baseline. Once people are acclimated to paying this without complaint, then we're just going to hit them with more things because they'll pay those without serious complaint either. So, Ant, walk us through the very early years of the federal income tax. When the federal income tax was first instituted back in the early 1900s, politicians promised that this was a tax on the rich 
and it was coming in at something like 1% or 2%, and it was only going to apply to the very rich. We needed a constitutional amendment for this, and I think it passed in large part because people understood that this was not a tax on the regular person. It took less than a decade. It was seven years, just seven years, before that tax was extended all the way down to the poor, down to what in today's dollars would be less than 20000 a year income household. Ouch. That's the tax that the politicians promised was only on the rich. And the lesson here is that if you're listening to the promises of a politician, stop doing that. Politicians exist to make politicians happy, not to make you happy. And I'm going to make a prediction here because I thought it was kind of bold years back when you and I predicted that eventually the federal government's going to come after the middle class. But here we see it happening. I'll make another prediction that I think is equally bold, and I wouldn't at all be surprised that we're talking about it 10 years from now. And that is a proposal that everyone's savings, all of it, whatever you have, your house, your car, your savings account, 401k, all of it goes to the federal government when you die. Because why? Well, because the federal government is providing free health care and free tuition and universal basic income. And it's only right and just, the politicians will say, that all this stuff that you own, because you don't need it anymore, you're dead, should go back to the federal government. And when that happens, we are serfs. We are no longer free people going about our lives. We are serfs working on the federal government's property. Easy there, comrade. (laughs) I'm fired up. I was working on the estate tax all day. (laughs) You took a wrong career move at some point. Listen, if Ant's right about what he just said, and I know you're all thinking he's insane, but you all thought we were insane a couple of years back when we predicted that the government would be coming for damn near everyone, and it's trending that way. So if Ant's right, you're really going to have to protect yourself with things like cash, things that can't be seen and can't be just taken away. It's going to be cash money. It's going to be hard money, precious metals, and it's going to be crypto money. These are the only things you'll be able to withstand a complete and total hit on your private property. These things will allow you to retain some of what you already owned. Right. And I'll point backward and forward. Backward, the federal government has in the past confiscated people's gold. And looking forward, the government is interested in the new digital dollar. That is a cryptocurrency version of the U.S. dollar. That animal isn't cryptocurrency in the way that you and I think of it. That's cryptocurrency controlled by the federal government. That's more government fiat money. It's something that the federal government will be able to track. When that comes about, when we get digital dollars in full, paper dollars will be gone. Checks will be gone. Everything will be digital and the government will know exactly how much money you have at every point in time. And they'll also know what you used it for when you spent it. Right. And if that's not terrifying to you... Nothing will ever be terrifying to you. Now, I want to point out something here. You and I try to be reasonable people. We try. And we've often said that we don't like to do the talking head thing. We just try to be reasonable people. And this conversation sounds like crazy people. No, no, no. You haven't yelled or screamed at all. (laughs) But this is how far things have come. That the guys who are saying that they're reasonable people are saying the same kinds of words that crazy people said 20 years ago. And look, if you're out there and you're paying any attention at all, do you trust any level of government? And if your answer to that question is yes, you're wrong. You should never trust any level of government. This is what happens when you trust them for too long. They come up with bigger and worse harebrained schemes every year out. And sooner or later, the rule is going to be what Ant said earlier. They're just going to take every single thing. And how do I know this? But because most of us, Knowing what the rules are would just give all of our property to our children at the end of our lives. If you get old and you're looking around, you say, all right, we're going to sign the house over to the kids and all this kind of stuff. And of course, I'm going to keep living in it until I die. But technically, you're going to be the owners from here on out. And that gets you around these kind of problems. So the government is going to disallow that kind of thing. You won't be able to sign over your property to your children. I guarantee you people are thinking about it right now. When that comes to pass, you don't have any kind of freedom left. The insidious thing is they're not going to come right out with something like that. It's going to come in bits and pieces, push a little bit each year, such that 20 years from now, 
it doesn't seem like a crazy idea. And there's this story. There are two. One is the frog in the boiling pot, and that's actually untrue. You put a frog into water and it starts to boil, that frog's going to jump right out. Training elephants, on the other hand, I do believe this is true. When you train an elephant, you start with a big giant stake in the middle of a circle and you tie a gigantic rope to the elephant and the stake and you walk them around in circles. Every so often, you make that big giant rope a little smaller. And before long, you have functionally what is a string connecting an elephant to the center of the circle. Really what it means is that you don't need any rope at all anymore because the elephant has internalized it. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but it points in the direction of what you're talking about here. When everything happens in bits, pieces, and chunks, you never really see it happening. It's nothing that you can see from the perspective of your day-to-day life. Where can you see it? Well, when you stop thinking about the here and now and just take a look at the sweep of history. When you look at things that way from a detached observer's perspective, well, it's real clear what direction we're going in. I mean, there's no doubt about it. But most of us don't take that detached view. And I don't think you're an idiot if you don't see it in your everyday life. Why would you? Right. You really need a different perspective on it. There's an example here going back to the birth of the income tax. When the amendment was being debated, there was a discussion in Congress and Of course, the proposal was it's a 1% tax. It only applies to the rich. One of the congressmen who was debating against this amendment got up and said, look, if we allow this, if we allow the federal government to tax people's incomes, before you know it, they'll be taxing everybody and they'll be taxing them. And he named a number. And people laughed. They laughed out loud at him saying there's no way the federal government would ever tax people that much. The number he named, 5%. (laughs) Today, our federal income tax code kicks in for the poor at 10%. Double what they laughed at him about. Yeah, sounds about right. And look, the poor get all of that back and more. It's the point that we're pressing here. Right. And then you start looking at these state taxes, as we talked about last week, when New York and California start putting their finger on the scale, you're looking at 60, 61% combined state, local, and federal tax. That's just crazy. How did we get here to 60%? If I'm only bringing home 39 cents of every dollar I make, I'm not going to bother myself making a whole lot of dollars. Because what's the point? The government gets more of them than I do. Yeah. Think about that for a second. The government gets more of my income than I get. People tell me that that's what fairness looks like. People will say that, well, once upon a time in this country, we had a 92% tax bracket, and that's correct, but that tax bracket ended up applying to something like 150 people. And the next year, it was long gone. Yeah, and it turns out that it didn't work. It collected not anywhere near what people thought it would for obvious reasons. If you're being taxed at that level, there's no point in getting your income up to that point. I think this was under the... George Herbert Walker Bush administration, somebody went to the Congressional Budget Office and said, okay, how much would the federal government take in the form of receipts if we raised income taxes to 100% for everyone? The CBO, doing its business the way it always does, ran the numbers with probably 40 or 50 PhDs trying to figure out what the correct answer to a math problem is. And they came back with a number that was equal to GDP. Right. They thought that you could actually collect 100% income from every single person in the country. Meanwhile, way off to the side, I was asking questions like, why would anybody work at all? (laughs) If you're not going to make a dollar for anything you do, why would you do anything? And I was a graduate student at the time. I was taking classes with a bunch of crackpots. And they said, oh, no, 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 James, you're crazy. Of course, people would continue to work. At the time, I'm thinking, son, you got to be kidding. Yeah. How did you get a PhD and why are you teaching this class? Shame on you and everybody involved with the entire ordeal. Because nobody would do anything. Tax receipts would be zero. Right. Because of course they would be. Politicians think that you can twist that dial as far to the right as you want. So let's just go confiscate everybody's money. The moral of the story is 
pay attention to what these politicians are doing and push back on them as much as you can because every step they take forward in taking more of our money makes it easier for them to take the next step. Yep. And before you know it, you're where we are now versus 1% tax or where we will be 20, 30 years from now when basically the federal government takes everything. When you see people at the federal level saying things like, this only applies to the super rich, understand that that's going to be you 10 years later. Yep, you're next. You are absolutely next because if you confiscated all the wealth of the top 1%, you really don't have much, comparatively speaking. What you have to do is tax the entire middle class because then you got something. There are a lot of people in the middle class. There are very few people in that top bracket. And you can see what's going on here because they are taxing the rich. They're not taxing the middle class because the middle class is a tremendous number of voters. The rich aren't. But boy, they'd love to get their hands on the middle class's money. When politicians are able to pit the middle class against the rich by saying things like, well, we should only tax the rich, you're being pitted against other Americans. But in 10 years, it's going to be you and it's going to be the working class. Mm -hmm. 10 years later, it's going to be the working class and the poor. I'm not surprised at all that politicians behave this way. I'm a little disgusted that my fellow Americans refuse to pay all that much attention to it. That's all the time we've got this week on Words and Numbers. Join us next week when we finally talk about something that doesn't irritate me and have me... What could that possibly be? <laughs> ...having an aneurysm here as we record. <laughs> Until then, you can find us on Twitter. Handles are in the show notes. And you can join Words and Numbers backstage where the conversation continues. You can also... Contribute to our Patreon account at patreon.com slash words and numbers and send us email words and numbers podcast at gmail.com. And for crying out loud, be nice to each other. Pay attention to the politicians and be nice to each other. And if I could only pick one of those two things, I would pick your being nice to each other because that's actually way more important. And I'll catch you next week. See you next week, James. James.